From recent versions of Spring Security, I have the authorization server. This authorization server allows me to implement the OS2 and AutoID Connect. Let's see it. I will create three backends. The first one will be the authorization server. I will call it backend out. And I need the following dependencies. Spring Security, Web, JPA, Postgres, Lombok and Mapstruct and of course OS2 authorization server. But this one I will add it manually. The next backend is the resource server. I will call it backend resources. But wait, what's the role of each of those backends? There are multiple servers when using the OS2 protocol. The first one is the authorization server. This one is the one, the only one, which stores the credentials. It's the one dedicated to validating the username and password of the end user. I will call it backend auth. Then comes the resources server. This is the one which contains the protected data. But this protected data won't be requested directly by the end user. Another third server will request it. Let's call this one backend resources. And finally, the client server. This is the server which will request the protected data. This is also the server used by the end user. Let's say I am a regular user of a site. I brag about my vacations and I want to upload some of my pictures to the site. The pictures are stored in my personal account along with my emails. So the client, which is the site I brag about my vacations, will try to access the resources, which are the pictures located on a separate server. To access those pictures, the client will need my authorization. To do so, the client will delegate the authentication to the authorization server. Now I'm talking directly with the authorization server. It will ask me for my credentials and ask if I consent the client I brag about my vacations to access the protected pictures. This way, the site I brag about my vacations doesn't need to store my credentials. It delegates all of this to the authorization server. Nevertheless, the communication between the client and the authorization server is only possible if the client is already known by the authorization server. The client must previously obtain a client ID and a client secret from the authorization server, otherwise the authorization server won't trust it. Now the client, I brag about my vacations, has the consent to access the protected pictures. Nevertheless, consent is only given for a specific scope, so the client can access the resources within this given scope. Let's reformulate the workflow. I consent the client to access protected resources on my behalf, and the client doesn't need my credentials for that. Only the authorization server handles my credentials. That was cool, but what about the OpenID Connect? The previous workflow was only about the O2 protocol, but the OpenID Connect, or the OIDC, is just another layer on top of the O2 protocol. Let's see what changes. The components are exactly the same. I still have the client, the resources, and the authorization server. When the client asks for the authorization, I won't ask for a specific scope, but for the OpenID Connect scope. With the OS2 protocol, the client asks for the scopes like read pictures, edit pictures, read profile, or read contacts. With the OpenID Connect, the client asks for the OpenID scope. This won't return a simple code as before for a single usage. Instead, the authorization server will respond with a rich full JWT with a lot of claims. Those claims are endpoints and encryption information to facilitate new requests from the client. If the client needs another code to access the pictures again, it already has the necessary endpoints to get a new generated code to be used again the resource server. No need to ask for the credentials. Ok, let's go back to creating the backends. I was creating the authorization server with the name backend house. It needs the dependencies, Spring Security, Web to communicate with the client and resource server, JPA and Postgres where will be stored the credentials, and Lombok. I will also add manually the OS2 authorization server and Mapstruct. The next backend is the resource server, with the name backend resources. Here I need the dependencies Spring Security, Web and the OS2 resource server. And the last one, the client with the name backend client with the following dependencies Spring Security, Web, the OS2 client and Webflux with Neti to request the resource server easily. 
I've downloaded everything and already configured it a little bit. In the backend alf, I've configured the connection to the database, created the table and the entity to store the users, also created the JPA repository and a DTO with a mapper to read the incoming credentials, then the password encoded used to store the passwords, and the algorithm to generate the tokens. In the backend resources, I've just created the endpoint which returns the protected information. Let's say some messages. And in the backend client, I've done nothing. Let's start with the easiest one, backend resources. Here I need to protect all the endpoints with a given scope. The services which request those endpoints must be authenticated with the host 2 and have a specific scope. Let's do it. Here I protect all the endpoints with the authentication. With those lines I indicate which scope is necessary to request the endpoints. Finally I indicate that I'm a resource server and a JWT will be used to validate the authentication against the authorization server. Let's go now to configure the authorization server in this backend. This makes backend resources the ability to validate the code which comes from backend client. Let's go now with the client, with the backend client. Let's start with the public controller. In the controller, I need to indicate that the requested endpoint will require the O2 client to be correctly authorized. This O2 client contains the information about the scope and the authorization server. When done, the current backend client will request the backend resources for the messages. In the request, I must now include the O2 attributes. Finally, return to the end user the information from backend resources. The request to backend resources is done with the web client from Webflux. Let's see how to configure it.
The authorization client manager is the one dedicated to maintaining the authentication with the authorization server up to date. It's the one which will request the initial authorization or for a refresh token when the first one expires. Then comes the web client. The web client must also be aware of the O2 client manager, as the authorization code received from the backend house must be sent back to backend resources to request the protected resources. Let's now quickly see the security filter chain. Here I indicate that all the incoming requests must be authenticated. And to authenticate the request, the end user will be redirected to the host2 login page, which is present in backend out. Finally, I indicate that this is an host2 client server. Let's finally see how the client is configured. I need to configure both the OpenID Connect and the OS2 authorization code workflow. Within the OpenID Connect, I indicate the scope OpenID, and within the OS2 authorization code, I indicate the scope message read, which is the one asked in backend resources. Finally, I indicate where to locate the authorization server. Okay, I've configured the backend resources, which contains the protected messages. Then I've configured the backend client, which is the client used by the end user the client which will request the protected resources. The last step is to configure the authorization server, backend auth, which will manage the credentials of the end user. Let's directly start with the security filter chain.
The first noticeable thing is that I need to separate the security filter chain from my authorization server from the default security filter chain. Maybe in future versions of the authorization server, in more stable versions, this won't be needed. In the authorization security filter chain, I only indicate that whenever I have an exception, I redirect to the login page. And in the default security filter chain, I just protect all the endpoints and use the default login form used by Spring. Let's go now with the registered clients. Here is the same information as in backend client. Here is the client ID and client secret. This time the client secret is encoded using the previously configured password encoder. Then comes the authentication, which will be used to communicate between the backend client and backend auth. What are the workflows which will be used between the client and the authorization server? The authorized redirect URI, the acceptable scopes, all of this will be stored in memory. If I need a more dynamic authorization server, I can store this in a table in the database. And I even can create some endpoints to add, edit and delete the registered clients. And the last step is the configuration of the endpoints for the provider. I will leave the default settings for the endpoints. I just indicate the URL of the authorization server. As for the other backends, I've configured an alias to avoid having local hosts for everyone. The main point is to have different names for the browser store independent cookies. Let's continue now with some other bins. The first one is the converter. This one is used to read the username and password from the login page validation. If I use a custom login page, it's interesting to have a dedicated converter, as the information can be sent in different formats. And the last bin, the provider. This one is interesting as it's the one which will check the authentication object with the data in the database.
I first read the username and password from the authentication object created in the converter. Then find the user with the same username. And finally, check the given password against the password stored in the database using the password encoder. Good, I've created the three backends. Backend client is the one which is used by the end user. Backend resources, which contains the protected messages backend client will try to request. And backend house, which is the only one where the credentials are stored. So let's test all of this. I will try to get the messages from the backend client endpoint. As this endpoint requires information from backend resources, the authentication is necessary, and it's delegated to the backend auth. I can see that the scope asked is the open ID. Once authenticated, the backend client asks for the consent of the message read scope. Once authenticated with the open ID scope, backend client asks for the scopes without asking again the credentials. Finally, I'm redirected to the original endpoint from backend client. The request made to backend resources isn't visible here, as the request is made from backend to backend. Ok, a very quick recap of this long video. I've created three backends. Backend client, which is the client. The one used by the end user. Backend resources, which is the one which has the protected resources and backend auth, which is the only one which contains the credentials information. When asking for the protected resources on backend client, it delegates the authentication to backend auth. Backend auth proceeds with the authentication and asks the end user to give consent to backend client to access the protected resources. Once accepted, backend client is able to request backend resources. Using OpenID Connect, backend client doesn't need to ask the credentials every time it requires to access other protected resources. It doesn't ask for credentials, neither if the tokens expire. That's all for this video, I hope you liked it. If you want more details about the O2 or other authentication protocol, just ask it in the comments. I will try to make a video. And see you soon, bye!